Well, good morning, church. I always feel it's a bit sad stopping a lovely conversation and that beautiful hum of uh, uh, brothers and sisters just joining together. But um, Sarah and team, thank you for that great worship. I was just saying to Ben, who chose the, uh, the worship this morning? And he said, Sarah did. And I said, well, that's amazing because her theme is really my theme as well. You know, that one there that Ben prayed about, I cast all my fears and cares, my worries and doubts, and uh, Jesus is the answer. In some ways, I want to talk about that uh, in a moment or two so that we can celebrate in that way. But um, I bet Joseph is not only preaching up a storm down in Hawke's Bay, I bet he's walking on cloud nine after the Warriors win last (laughs) night. I mean, what a win. Uh, Now we just need to see them go on and, uh, and on into greater things. Uh, for the, just a quick short intro for those of you who don't marry, I, uh, know me, I'm married to Judy, and uh, we have four kids and 11 grandkids, so uh, we're uh, getting a bit older. Um, I've been a pastor since 1977, early 1977, we were just chatting um, to folk around and someone had said, how long have you been in ministry? And I said, 77, and, they said, how, and someone said, how old were you then? And they said, minus 18 made me feel sort of slightly uh, old, but uh, I guess that's the, re- the reality. I've served the uh, local church and the national church for 41 years in parish ministry, and uh, in recent years I've been involved in more parachurch or other activities, um, quite involved with Christian Blind Mission, CBM, as are, they're not here today, but um, Andrew Smith and uh, Neil Murray also serve on the board of CBM. So there are three of us from St. Luke. Three of the nine trustees of CBM go to St. Luke's. Uh, so that's pretty good. CBM, by the way, is a, uh, a disability inclusion uh, INGO that works with people living with disabilities in the poorest parts of the world. Last year, I completed uh, my term as the New Zealand representative on the main governing body of the World Council of Churches. So I, uh, I have been around the church a lot. And uh, I guess, you know, being on the WCC, I've seen virtually every shade and color and belief of Christianity there is. And just a great experience of meeting brothers and sisters from virtually every country of the world in uh, that experience, in that place. But now I'm just enjoying being part of St. Andrew's, sitting here being blessed, not St. Andrew's, <laughs> St. Peter's, St. Andrew's, St. Luke's. St. Andrew's where I used to be. <laughs> Uh, St. Luke's, sitting under Joseph's ministry and many others like uh, Rosie who shared with us last week and really enjoying the uh, friendship and fellowship our church family here. Okay, let's pray. Gracious God, you uh, are above us, you are around us, you are within us. And in each situation we can experience something of your goodness and your grace, your presence, your power. Uh, Today, as we turn to your word, we pray that you would speak to us a word in season. Amen. Uh, Revelations, uh, not the book that I'm going to preach on today, but in the the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, uh, the risen Christ, uh, or John writes uh, uh, to the seven churches, seven of the early churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, with a message from the risen Christ to each of those uh, churches. And each of the seven letters follows a, a, a pattern of commendation, complaint, and correction. And then at the end of each letter, there is a, uh, a word, Ben, am I in trouble? There we go. At the end of each uh, um, letter, there is a a promise to the one who overcomes. You know, all your cares and fears and worries and doubts and anxieties, the one who overcomes. Or as some translations say, the one who is victorious. The the word in Greek for overcome or victorious is uh, nike, 
And uh, Nike, of course, was the Greek goddess of victory. Um, but if you were, today we use that word Nike, but I think we pronounce it differently. We call it uh, Nike. If you're wearing Nike shoes, well, that means you are pretty good. You are uh, an overcomer. You are victorious in the race. But if you're like me and you wear Essex, well, I guess we're second best. Maybe we're losers. I don't know what we are, but I tell you what, which one looks better anyway? So I know which one I would be wearing. Uh, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> In the Christian faith, we're called, we're challenged, we're invited uh, to be overcomers. And uh, the implication of that is the harsh reality that in life we will face problems, we will face obstacles, we will face barriers, we will have difficulties. Uh, I, I would love to uh, just preach on the prosperity gospel when all goes well, but I'm not sure that life is like that. We face headaches. And whether in the early church as in Revelation or us today, the reality is that we as Christians will face difficulties from time to time. And as the letter said to the early church, as the risen Christ was speaking to the early church, he said, you know, you have persevered. I understand that. I see that. And, you know, the church is very young when this letter is written, uh, probably around about 100 AD. You've already persevered. You've endured. You've been afflicted. You've been in poverty. And what is true of the early church is also equally true of us. And so today I want to share a few thoughts on uh, overcoming obstacles uh, to uh, break through. The next one, we're breaking through, from overcoming obstacles to break through. I guess that um, I am probably one of the older folk that uh, Joseph invites to preach in this church. And uh, I thought, you know, what might I, as an older guy, offer younger folk in the faith? What could I share as something of my experience of uh, a lifelong walk uh, with Jesus and discipleship? How can I help people be faithful in the long term? And you see, if we're going to be faithful uh, in the long term, faithful and strong, finish strong in our discipleship, one of the things we have to do is learn to overcome. We have to learn to overcome. And I say that not only from experience, but I also believe theologically that's true. I mean, it's, it's not a message for today. It's a different message. But I would say to you that I actually think part of living the resurrection life here on earth today is learning to cope and live with suffering. Suffering is actually part of the resurrection life. Well, let me tell two stories. The um, Just could you push the button there, please? Yeah, let me tell you two stories. Um, uh, one of them is mythical, and you'll pick that up very quickly, but the second one is true. Two men, first story, two men got shipwrecked on an island, and one started screaming and yelling, we're gonna die, we're gonna die. There's no food, there's no water. The second man leaned up quite relaxed against a palm tree so calmly that it drove the first man crazy. Don't you understand? We're going to die, the, second, uh, the guy said. The second man replied, Ah, oh, you don't understand. I make $100,000 a week. The first man looked at him dumbfounded and asked, What difference does that make? We're shipwrecked on an island with no food and no water. We're going to die. And the second man answered, you're the one who just doesn't get it. I make $1,000 a week, and I tithe on those $100,000 to my church. My pastor will find me. <laughs> well, you might be saying, but I don't make $100,000 a week. Well, I don't either. But I can tell you that I have been on the shipwrecked island many times in my discipleship and in my faith walk, uh, it, it is something that uh, when I have been anxious and concerned, uh, felt shipwrecked, 
unable to see an answer, to find a solution for a way forward, and no doubt you too. And yet the encouraging thing is, here we are, you and me, together, we're here. We've survived 100% of our worst days, and we're still here. Second story. 19 days ago, my brother-in-law set out to do a regular bike ride of about uh, 60 kilometres, a ride that he's done many, many times before. He was an excellent rider and a very experienced rider. But about 400, maybe 500 metres from his home, he was biking down a slight incline. And we don't know what, but he must have hit something because he flew over his handlebars, landed on his head, and broke his neck. He was uh, totally paralyzed and couldn't breathe. For two days, he was on a ventilator. Unfortunately, the injuries that he suffered were so severe that he could not sustain life. Twelve days ago, uh, we had his funeral. For us as a family, we are back on the shipwrecked island with many questions, unanswered questions. You know, why? Why do these things happen? It always seems unfair in a time of tragedy. You see, my brother-in-law had only retired at the end of last year, and he had a great long bucket list of things that he was wanting to do. In fact, two days after the funeral, he and his wife were booked to go on an OE to Europe and to England. The plans of all had to be cancelled. Back on the shipwrecked island. You see, life is not always smooth sailing. Problems, sadness, sickness, obstacles cross our paths. And I don't know about you, but it's, I find it amazing how often I and I hear other people using words like unfair, unlucky, frustrating, unfortunate, annoying, inconvenient. You know, most of us from a, a very early age seem to have an innate belief or a desire for fairness and justice. We like fairness and justice. If you've got kids or grandkids, I'm sure you've heard, it's not fair, or he got more than me, or a whole range of uh, other words like that. And as we grow, though, we realize that things or events in themselves are neither fair nor unfair, they just are. What causes us the pain is our judgment of the event. And that's a very hard lesson to learn. For it goes against every impulse that we have. But the reality is we've got to learn to live with the hand we have been dealt with. And for each of us, that can be different. It's not easy. I can tell you I have shed many tears in my faith walk. I don't know how many nights when I haven't slept, you know, with anxious thoughts and fears and things going through my mind. It hasn't been easy. And yet a key secret to this lifelong faithful discipleship is learning to be an overcomer of all that hurts and hinders us. You know, where there is life, there's always going to be unwanted stuff. You know, as, as one wit said, you know, um, if there is no manure, there is no milk. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. There's a way that we can go from pieces to piece in the shipwrecked, uh, on the shipwrecked island of life times. And I've found that through the good times and the not so good times, God has still been with me. God has never left me. 
At times I felt he might have. Even when I've doubted, even when I've questioned. And I've also found that some of those problems, some of those difficult times in life, have actually brought me closer to God and actually to find resources that I wouldn't have discovered if it hadn't been through those problems in times of difficulty. Some of you will have heard of the, uh, or read some of the work books of John Maxwell, a Christian author. John Maxwell tells the story of a man who, in America, who watched to, uh, stopped to watch a little league game. And uh, he asked one of the youngsters, what's the score? And the kid said, we're 18 to nothing. We're behind 18 to nothing. And the man said, well, you don't look very discouraged. Discouraged, said the boy. Why should we dis be discouraged? We haven't battered yet. <laughs> you see, people who overcome actually have a confidence, like that little kid. Things don't always end happily, but people who overcome have the confidence and the competence to hang in there till something good happens. Confident people look at things differently, think differently, act differently, and they're contagious. You actually want to be around confident people because they can boost you. And I guess as followers of Jesus, we should be that confident group. So when you're up against something big, face it head on with God by your side. That's what David did with his Goliath. He picked up his only resource, a slingshot and five stones. The first stone he hit through hit the giant in the head and down he went. And afterward, David said, you know, Goliath was easier to defeat when I killed the lion and the bear. He was so big I couldn't miss him. As he said, I was only trying to get ahead in life. I think that might be a dad joke <laughs> or a granddad joke. Well, anyway, to help us learn to be overcomers, what I'd like to do today is take you to a passage in Scripture that I have found over the years has actually laid some foundations or principles or guidelines, not the specifics, but the principles that I then need to apply and you would need to apply to help us become overcomers. This is the story of Elisha and a poor widow in 2 Kings 4. And uh, to, I, I just hope that th as we work through this passage of 2 Kings 4, we might find some principles um, that you would be able to apply in your context, whether family or work or church or, or wherever, on how to be an overcomer. And as I said right at the start, I think one of the biggest barriers to growth in faith is the lack of breakthrough that we have. If you're just up against a brick wall all the time, it's pretty frustrating. How do we actually break through uh, those hardships and struggles in life? And uh, if you're anything like me, you know, when, often when things start going wrong, it seems that everything goes wrong. And no matter what we do, we don't seem to get the breakthrough that we're looking for. And when that happens, you know, I know in my faith journey, questions arise. God, can you hear me? God, can you answer my prayer? God, do you not even like me? You know, there's so many things that happen there. And eventually I know and I've seen it happen that many people give up the faith walk, stop going to church thinking, why bother with God at all? I guess over the years um, I have learned, clicker, yeah, uh, three little principles there, you know, hold on to God even against the odds when times are tough, when we've got those cares and fears and anxieties and doubts. Keep pressing into them even when it seems like nonsense. And keep faithful, even when others are giving up. As I said, I've learned that lesson the hard way, in family situations and in church life. See, as Christians, we do suffer. We do get sick. We do get depressed. We are made redundant. We do die. We go through times of confusion. We make mistakes. We wrestle with financial hardship. That's part of our faith walk. So let's look at in 2 Kings 4, 
that tells um, uh, one of those stories. So let's just read this together. Now, the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But his creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for a few empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. A widow's in deep trouble. So much trouble that she's in in the context of that day. If you can't pay your debt, they come and take your kids. This widow is going to lose her two sons and she's got no way of going forward. Now what is significant to me in this story is that her husband was a prophet. Her husband was a man of God. Her husband had revered God, served God, had been generous. In fact, as the story suggests, he was probably so generous, he gave away too much and left his widow and the two boys, his two sons, in poverty. He died in debt. And as it said, his creditor was coming to take the boys. In other words, the the wife who is suffering, the wife who is on the shipwrecked island, did not cause the debt. It wasn't her fault. Somebody else, her husband, had brought about the pain that she was now uh, going through. She suffers because of somebody else's actions. She did nothing to end up on the shipwrecked island of despair. You see, bad things happen to good people. And many times the problems we face are not our doing. I don't think that part of the story, this early part of the story, is unusual. Most of us can identify with suffering. But what is helpful, and I hope will be helpful for us, is how she overcomes. How does she break through? Well, I want to look at a few points that lead to breakthrough. The first one is, uh, thanks uh, for the next slide, is is prayer. Uh, If we're going to overcome obstacles as followers of Jesus, uh, we need to cry out to our Father. We need to pray. We need to talk about it to God, what we're going through. Look, not, look to God, not away from God in disgust and anger. You know, that, that's one of the temptations is that when things go wrong, we can get angry with God. We need to run to God, not away from God, and we, we do that in prayer. You know, when things go wrong, it is so easy to get angry, but anger never solves problems. It only makes them worse. This widow had every right to be angry at God, uh, even to reject God. But if you want to see breakthrough, I believe that prayer will be a key foundational element in in helping to see through. So this widow calls to God by crying out to his prophet Elisha, pray for breakthrough in big matters, pray for breakthrough in small matters that affect you personally and your family. The second uh, question, thing is the key to overcoming uh, barriers is ask the right questions. 
I think this is a very important key in, in, in overcoming the difficulties in life. Ask the right questions. You see, when things go wrong, it is so easy to focus on the pain. It's so easy to focus on the suffering. It is so easy to focus on that which is hurting us. And in the process, we actually put the, the, the focus on the barrier rather than the breakthrough. Part of the secret of making a breakthrough is to ask the right questions and so lift the focus off the problem. It's far more important to look at the uh, root of the problem than the problem itself. The problem that we see is far more obvious a symptom than a cause. And to get a breakthrough into solution, we need to be able to uh, look at the cause and deal with that. And so Elisha asks, how can I help you? What do you want me to do for you? What do you got? I wonder how you act when somebody's in trouble, a friend, and they're suffering. Well, I know how what I've done in my pastoral ministry over all the years, and I probably haven't always done what Elisha did in this case. There are many other things that Elisha could have done, things that we often do, I often do, when trying to help people in trouble. He could have given her comforting words, words of solace, words of hope. He could have gone around the company of the prophets and taken up an offering and said, hey, let's give this to our, our brothers left um, his wife in debt and they're coming to take his sons. Come on, let, let, let's take up an offering and, and help her out. He could have preached a message. You know, that's what preachers do. He could have gone back through the law of Moses and uh, said about, look, it's not going to be that bad. You know, under the law of Moses, uh, your sons may be taken, but they will be treated well as hired workers, and it will only be for a time until the debt's paid. You'll get your sons back again. But he didn't do any of those things. You see, to do so would be to focus on the problem. Rather, he asked, what do you have? Rather than solve the problem independently of the woman, he focused on her and forced her to think of a solution. Thirdly, uh, focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. And that's always a hard thing to do. So often in life, especially when facing problems, we think about what we don't have that would help us if we had them. If only I had, if only I won lotto, if only my son or daughter would, if only, are two very destructive words. The if only attitude doesn't lead to breakthrough, it leads to despair and doubt. I think any parent or probably any grandparent too knows this truth only too well with our children or our grands. You know, you can give your kids a special day. You know, take them to McDonald's, take them to the movies, buy them sweets, ice cream, finish at a swimming pool or whatever, whatever, and say, did you enjoy your day? Yes, but I really wanted KFC or pizza. There seems to be something in our human uh, nature that focuses on what we don't have or what we have missed out on rather than what we have. And many of us as adults are actually very little different than children. Elisha says, uh, tell me, what do you have? What do you have in your house? She replies, I've got nothing. Well, except a small jar of oil. It's all we've got left. No food, nothing. Elisha says, okay, take it. Use it and see what God will do. You see, God asks us to look at what we have and be grateful for it and then use it with him. He doesn't ask us to look at what we don't have. He will bring the increase. I don't know what problems you may be facing in your life at this time, but if, I, if you're facing a problem, I'd be pretty sure that like the rest of us, you could well be thinking if only, if only putting the focus on what you don't have rather than thinking, well, I have this, I have that. I have this blessing or that blessing. God, I offer it to you. Take it. Use it. That's where miracles occur. 
You may remember, of course, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And night time comes and he says to his disciples, hey, come on, let's feed this, these people. And the disciples think about what they don't have. They say, Jesus, you, you want to feed these folk? Uh, do you realize that that will take a year's wages and we haven't got a year's wages? And then Andrew pipes up and says, hey, but there's a little boy here who's got five loaves and two fish. And I can imagine them saying, five loaves and two fish and 5,000 plus men and men plus women and children. Are you crazy? And Jesus says, ah, that's what we need. Let's focus on what we have, not on what we don't have. Just a little point for you to ponder one day. In this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, when did the bread and fish multiply? Did the bread and fish multiply when Jesus took it and prayed over it? Did it multiply when uh, the disciples took the little bit they had and started ripping off and giving out? I've got no idea. I don't know the answer. I tell you what I think. I think it's probably the second thing. I think it's when our faith is tested that we grow. The fourth point that leads to breakthrough is uh, obedience. Go ask your neighbors for jars and ask for heaps of them is what Elisha says to the woman. And so the woman has to obey, no matter how foolish or ridiculous this proposal seems. She could have complained to Elisha, hey, you're going to make me look a fool in front of my neighbors. But she believed, she obeyed, and she broke through. She had a part to play in over her coming problems. While she depended on others to help her, her neighbors, she still had to take the step of faith herself. She had to play the critical part by taking the small jar of oil and starting to pour it into the larger vessels. And it was only then as she took that step of faith that, uh, in obedience that um, uh, it began to flow. Can you imagine how her faith would have grown when she saw that the oil never stopped flowing? Jar after jar after jar, after jar. A small but significant point too is uh, the one that's up on the, uh, no, the next one. Uh, yeah, the next point that's important there is um, that when God calls us to break through into faith, he does not always make a show of it or intend us to make a big show of it. Close the door, go inside, close the door. The blessing of the miracle was for the woman and her two boys, no one else. Fifthly, be expansive. Do you note that the oil only stopped flowing when all the jars were full? Bring the next uh, jar, son. This is great, she says. Uh, sorry, mum, there are none left. We didn't get enough jars from the neighbors. The implication is, if she had got more jars from her neighbors, more oil would have flowed. There would be more oil for her and her sons. Often our faith is smaller than God's promises. He gives more than we ask. And lastly, the last point that I would make is that overcoming obstacles is, is pay your debts before you worry about yourself. Fulfill your, the, your requirements to others before thinking about yourself and your problems, before she makes provision for herself and her children, she must first pay her husband's debts. Breaking through problems can be an exciting part of our discipleship and our faith walk. Just the summary of them all up on the screen now, it'd be, uh, if you can just put the next slide up there, pray. Ask the right questions. Focus on what you have, not what you don't have. The importance of obedience. Be expansive. Pay debts. Can I encourage you to think about those principles that we have looked at that might apply in your life? The next slide there, just in, in, in this coming week, you know. In your life, in your work, whatever, your family, uh, what might... If you were to apply the principle, what would the pots be? 
What do you need a bit more of? What do you need to go and ask someone for help from? What would be the oil? I know we always probably associate oil with money, but I actually think it can be more than money too. What would be those things there? I want to finish with just a uh, few one-liners uh, along that theme. You know, not every day is good, but there's something good in every day. A pessimist makes difficulties of their opportunities, and an optimist makes opportunities of their difficulties. What I know of fear is that it has cost me far more than bravery ever has. The enemy may hide wolves in sheep's clothing, but God hides lions inside a lambs. Let's be lions inside a lambs. Communion. <clears throat> Communion is one of the, uh, the great gifts that uh, God gives us to cope, to empower, to help us in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, when uh, faith is struggling, when we've got those cares and fears and anxieties and doubts. He invites us into his presence uh, to be able to minister to us uh, in, in a special way. And, I've, you know, I've always found communion quite strange because it, it always seems so simple. I, I don't know how, how Jesus could get something more simple, more ordinary than this. You know, a dice of bread and a thimble of wine or juice. And yet through my faith walk, this meal has ministered to me in profound ways, time after time after time. You know, no matter how many times I have participated in this meal, there is something uh, special about it, something mysterious in the way it ministers to us. And I think that the early church had a real understanding of that too. Uh, you may remember that in, in Luke's gospel and in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul writes about the institution of the communion meal, you may remember some of the words that were said. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he uh, gave it to his disciples and said, uh, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me or do this is for my memorial. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he lifted the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. Now, what I find uh, interesting is that the word translated remembrance, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me or do this for my memorial, uh, the Greek word that the New Testament writers used is a strange word. It's anamnesis, anamnesis. And for those of us that speak English, we have no equivalent. There is no English word to translate anamnesis. And so we use the word memorial or memory or words like that, but that can... Um, give us who speak English a false understanding of what the disciples are telling us when we celebrate communion. Like if I think about, you think about remembering or memorial or something like that, I don't know what image springs to your mind, but one of the ones that would spring to my mind in New Zealand is an Anzac Day service. We gather for Anzac Day services and uh, we are there to remember the events of World War I, World War II, family members who may have gone and fought uh, in wars. In other words, uh, that is a purely subjective exercise. Anamnesis means something quite different than that. Anamnesis means that a past event is not simply recalled but the past event is made present. Anamnesis transcends space and time. 
in a way that that past event which take, took place once for all in history is represented and made available contemporaneous. Thus, a communion meal is not just a remembering. It's not a commemoration. Neither is it an acting out, a dramatic imitation of, uh, of an historical event. But by virtue of anamnesis, this communion meal represents for us Jesus, his life, and his ministry. What is being made present? Is it the Last Supper? Is it the cross? I think so, and all of those and more. I think it's actually representing to us the ministry of Christ, his birth, his life, his ministry, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the gift of the Spirit. And when we come to the table, Jesus is ministering to us in all of these ways. So welcome to this table. Come not because you feel strong, but because you feel weak. Come because you feel you're on a shipwrecked island with no hope. You'd love to be found. You want someone to find you. And I can tell you, you don't have to tie the $100,000 or even $10 to come to this table. Just come. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but come because, like all of us, you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and you would like to love him more. Come because you love Jesus and Jesus loves you and gave himself for you. So taste and see how gracious the Lord is. This is the Lord's table, and he invites us to come and participate in the full benefit of his life today. Come and let the Lord minister to you. The table is open.